Welcome to Doc NYC's Friday Fix. I'm Tom Powers, the festival's artistic director, streaming from my home office in Montclair, New Jersey. This is episode two of our new weekly series. We can't fix the world's problems, but we can give you a fix of our favorite filmmakers. If you missed episode one, you can find us at the link below that says more on Friday Fix. Uh, today, our guests are uh, Janet Tobias, director of the pandemic documentary, Unseen Enemy, that came out three years ago. Her film was prescient about what we're facing today. Um, I was gonna have Janet on as our first guest, although I'm just having a little trouble connecting with her, so we're gonna try to bring her on later. Uh, what that's gonna move to our first segment will be Stephen Bognar and Julia Reichert, the Oscar-winning filmmakers of American Factory. They have a new film called nine to five the story of a movement and we'll hear more about it uh, then in our uh later segment i'll talk to gordon quinn the founder of chicago's production company cartem quinn gordon spent the last two months battling a serious case of covid 19. he was just released from the hospital on tuesday and he has thoughts to share uh, before i get to our guests let me offer some tips for your crowdcast experience we uh, encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box on the right. Tell us where you're from. If you have nice things to say about our guests, please share your comments. If you experience video delay, go to the help menu up at the top right and you can switch to compatibility mode. There's the best browser for Crowdcast is Chrome. You might get a better connection by closing other windows. We all know that video conferencing is prone to hiccups. If we do experience any tech issues, we'll try to notify you in the chat section or on our Facebook page. Usually we can fix problems within a few minutes. This video will be recorded. So afterwards, you can share the link for later viewing. Uh, now I'm gonna blow through some of the slides that I had for Julia and uh, just sure. get to uh, our next guest. Before I bring them on, I'm gonna say a few words of introduction about Julia Reichart and Stephen Bognar. Last November, they received the Robert Nan Drew Award for Excellence at Doc NYC's Visionaries Tribute. They have long careers directing documentaries from their base in Dayton, Ohio. Julia started out in the late 1960s with the sub and was the subject of several career retrospectives last year, including at MoMA and Ohio's Wexner Center. Her first film was Growing Up Female, interviewing women at a pivotal point in the feminist movement. She followed that up with uh, Growing Up uh, with uh, Union Maids about women's role in labor history. It was nominated for an Academy Award. For many years, Julia has been partners with Stephen Bognar personally and professionally. Together, they made the epic documentary Lion in the House about children with cancer. Uh, last year, they released American Factory, a study of an abandoned GM factory in Ohio that was taken over by a Chinese gas company. The film was supported by participant media and acquired by Netflix with Barack and Michelle Obama's company, Higher Ground. The film won this year's Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. Over the past couple of decades, Julia has been battling cancer on and off. It's recently returned. She has been heroic at how she's been soldiering on with everything else she's doing. And I want to bring them on right now uh, from Ohio. Please welcome Julie and Stephen. Hi. Hey guys, and uh, hey, it's a special day, you know. It's, uh, tell us. It's May Day. Yay. It's May Day. <laughs> we made uh, these and little red flags out of toothpicks and electrical tape. It's May Day, and, and we were going to be in New York City today showing Seeing Red, Stories of American Communists, at the Film Forum. Yeah. And we were going to have a march from Union Square to the Film Forum. But it turns out, like, I think the Amazon and delivery workers are out in the streets, so that's probably today yeah. in New York, and I think that's better. Right yeah, now. shout out to all the working folks who are, who are fighting for a better and safer deal right now, today. So speaking of labor, it brings me to your latest film, Nine to Five, The Story of a Movement. Uh, the themes have strong continuity with your earlier work from the feminist perspective of growing up female to the labor organizing in American factory. Um, 
you know, so people are watching may remember the 1980 comedy with Jane Fonda and the nine to five anthem by Dolly Parton. Yeah. What uh, I didn't know, and you may not know, is those stories were inspired by a real labor movement of female clerical workers that was called nine to five. The group started in Boston in the 1970s, part of a wave across the country. In the 1980s, the nine to five union suffered setbacks like all labor did in that decade. And the history was largely forgotten. Uh, right. Julie and Steve perform a remarkable job of telling that story with diverse voices from Boston to Atlanta, Cincinnati to Seattle and beyond. Their film was poised to play several spring festivals from South by Southwest to Full Frame in Cleveland. But with the wave of COVID-19 disruption, they pulled back uh, from those festivals, uh, uh, you know, waiting to regroup. Um, I got to see the film and was struck by how relevant it feels today to today's oh. Me Too conversation and the rise of female political candidates across lines of race. Um, so I want to get into talking about this. Julia, let me start with you. I mean, you've worked both on women's history and labor history for decades. When did you become aware of the nine to five movement and decide it should be a film? Well, actually, Tom, I was aware of the nine to five movement when it was a young movement in the beginning of the 70s through the 70s into the 80s. I mean, I was a young activist here in Ohio and uh, there was the working women's movement definitely reached out here. And it's very similar to what you saw in the film. They took a very funny, like poke fun of the boss, don't necessarily shout with picket signs. They took a different approach to how they were gonna create social change and I was, I went to some of those demonstrations. But as far as making it into a film, um, it was like seven or eight years ago, wasn't it? It was before American Factory ever got started. Oh, before we ever even thought yeah. about it. It was kind of like a quiet time in our lives. And we, we were actually taking care of our first grandchild in Washington, DC. And we happened to have dinner with Karen Nussbaum, who's one of the founders. You saw her in the film. We were having dinner and we ended up sort of reminiscing. And it sort of occurred to us, wow, this Nobody knows about this, and it, it's an exciting story. Uh, it's all women, you know, which appealed to me. And it's a different kind of, it's like a combination, which I saw of like a labor movement story with a women's movement story, right? So I that obviously appealed to me with all my work in the labor movement. Well, it's kind of coming full circle for Julia because her earlier films, as you mentioned, Tom, Union Made, Seeing Red, those are sort of birth of a movement type of films. Oral history. Oral yeah. history, combining great characters with archival. We love those movies. I mean, How to Survive a Plague is mm -hmm. like one of our favorite movies. Uh, this year's Crip Camp. Oh yeah. Amazing, mm -hmm. great film. We, lo movement, we yeah. love working in that kind of uh, that kind of uh, style and form, you know, even though we're more known for our cinema verite movies. But they're both, they're just a totally different approaches for different reasons, you know. So um that's how it got started. And we spent, you know, year after year finding the history, meeting the people, finding the archival footage. That all that takes a really long time if you do it kind of and it's it's a it's a film that we own. It's like not for a streamer or anything. It's like a non it's an old school like non Well, we're hoping film. a streamer will win. Well, yeah, but no, no, we, we, I think we made it independently. We funded it yeah. through grants. We didn't pre-sell it to anyone. But yeah, we are yeah. we are shopping it around. And this is this brings up the, the question of like this strange new world. Yeah. Where we were so excited to go Should to we tell you that story South about what happens in South by? Well, why don't you give me a condensed uh version <laughs> of that story? I mean, you know, yeah. they're there are hundreds of filmmakers now who had plans for spring festival that got disrupted. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, w when I think a lot of those filmmakers are first time filmmakers or earlier in their career mm -hmm. and they feel confused. Uh, but, right. then, you know, when we look at uh, veteran filmmakers like you coming off an Academy Award and, you know, and realize that you're in just as much disarray yeah. uh, trying to figure out what's next. Uh, maybe well, that's better. comforting. We're luckier though. And we feel we have friends who are young filmmakers uh, like Jenny Shi, who was about to premiere Finding Ying Ying at, at our fair time when films film. And Nicole Regal. At, at, and Nicole Regal, who's going to premiere her fiction debut at South by. You know, those are first timers who could really use the, the rocket fuel of South by Southwest. We, we feel very lucky that we're old farts now yeah. and that we, you know, we, we will, our film will be okay. 
And of course, our hearts go out to Janet and the entire team at South by and Sadie and Deirdre at Full Frame and Bill and Patrick at, at Cleveland, all these great film festivals that happen in the spring. They lost a year of work, like they just washed away. And it's just heartbreaking to see what, what's happened. For so, us, yeah, maybe. Well, we actually finished our mix the day we learned that South by was canceled. It was the week before South by. And like everybody, I mean, fast forward, we've all kind of decided to kind of wait, you know, wait to kind of week. It's really week by week. You know, we talk with our, the folks in our little team, you know, the PR people and the sales people and every week it's like, not yet. Um, but it, it's, we started getting really itchy to like, just get the film out there. You know, as you say, it's topical and like, okay, maybe we're all going to be online for a long time. So, so we looked at um, we, an offer we had from AFI Docs. That was the most, kind of the last big festival of the season for documentaries of the spring season. Then a movie came on TV. This is what kind of pushed us over the line to really get back into thinking about it. It's called Mrs. America. That's on the Hulu. series, right? Yeah. The fiction series, Kate Blanchett. Yeah. You know, it's the story of, of like the act of Phyllis Schlafly, Shirley Chisholm, Gloria Steinem in the 70s. And the, the debate, the, the real two movements for and against the ERA. Yeah. And of course, our people in our film were fighting for like more rights for women, you know, an end to sexual harassment, equal pay for equal work. But this, the Schlafly forces, which became very strong, which you see in the series, were fighting the exact opposite battle in the exact same time. And in fact, yeah. Crip Camp is also the exact same time frame. It all yeah. starts early 70s yeah. and goes all the way through and has repercussions for now. Yeah. So, so, so we decided like, we're, well. We're, so we're looking at doing, we, we haven't, Yeah. we're looking at doing an online premiere sometime this summer, which even a few weeks ago, we wouldn't have yeah. thought or said. It, it's just like, well, you, we've talked with you about it, Tom. Like, we don't know what's going to happen with even yeah. Toronto or. And one of know, the questions, so, of course, is for potential buyers, is an online premiere secure? Are we going to avoid piracy? Does it, if we do an online premiere, will buyers balk at, at, at the film? You know, so these are real life questions that we're, we're, we're grappling with. And we're really lucky. We're working with Submarine Entertainment, Josh Baron and TM, yeah. and also Ryan Werner and the great, great folks at, at, at Synetic, and they're helping us think all this through. But it kind of, yeah. I hope well, you guys see that show. I mean, it made me think this could be like a kind of a hook for talking about, you know, that era and this era. Yeah, well, I think it's on people's minds now, and you you, you can see a fictionalized version of it, you can uh, see the grassroots version in, uh, in your film. Um, Julia, I've talked before about your perseverance as you deal with cancer treatment. Can you talk about the, you know, the things that keep driving you forward on these projects? Well, I love my work. Um, that's, I guess that's the, what keeps driving me forward is there's always more stories out there and you always feel like, let's get out there and cover them. Like we're actually with working with a group of young filmmakers now, we can't go out. Um, but we're covering the pandemic in the Dayton, Ohio area. You know, the food banks, the homeless shelters, the making of PPE because you can't get it, like making it here locally. Uh, what's it? I mean, well, testing and stuff. And testing, so we, we have young yeah. camera people who go out and we make phone calls. And it's we do of, the producing part. It's like right? a ragtag little team, but so, some of whom were camera people on American Factory. But it seems to be working so far. Yeah, we're really, it, that's been exciting. Um, I don't know. Cancer is, you know, I have a fatal cancer. I have a cancer I'm not going to beat. In fact, I find it hard when people say, you're going to beat this, which I think most people with cancer, you don't know if you're going to beat it. Um, you hope you can make every day count. Um, and I think that's part of it too, is that, you know, after all these years, I have certain like skills and stuff and interests that I can help pass on to next generations. And I think that keeps me going, even though the illness comes and goes a lot. You know, honestly, I have, Gordon may talk about this too. You know, you have days when you're just so sick and in pain, you can't do anything. But then you wake up and you're okay. And it's, it really varies a lot. And, it's, and Julia's doing immunotherapy now. Yeah. She finished chemo and her hair, you can see Julia's hair is growing back. 
Not like at the Oscars. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, immunotherapy is cutting edge treatment. So it, it, it's less toxic, but it also works for fewer people. It doesn't work for very many people. I was just thinking about, you know, Jeff and Rob's film on Linda Ronstadt. She yeah, has yeah. a wonderful quote that I always remember. She said, I'm not concerned about life after death. I'm concerned about life before death. Because I know I'm facing my death. It could be any time a month, a year. We don't know. We really don't know. So I just have to yeah. do my Well, uh, you're really an inspiration to us all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you guys in the green room and try to bring in uh, Janet. So uh, don't go away. I'm going to bring you back shortly. We're so honored to be on the same show with the great, Mighty Gordon Quinn. The Mighty Quinn. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna bring you back before I bring in Gordon. I'm gonna bring you back to just say a few words about your history with Gordon. So, uh, oh, okay. stand by. I'm gonna mute you and and turn off your video and try and bring in Janet. Okay. So stand by. Uh, all right, uh, Janet. You can hear me. Let me see if I can bring you in. Inviting you in now. Um. While I uh, work to bring in Janet, me there she is. Hello, oh, Janet. Hello. What an what a hard act to follow. I mean, so much um, inspiration from Julia and Steve. Really. Yes. Yes. Very much so. Um, well, you know, I, I've been looking forward to talking to to you for a while, and you know, let me just give some people who don't know your work uh, a little background. Um, you know, uh, Janet has a unique career uh, being in both documentary production and doing research on the crossroads of technology and global health. She spent years in network news at 60 Minutes, Dateline NBC, ABC News, and uh, her documentary feature debut was No Place on Earth, uh, which is an extraordinary story of Ukrainian Jews who survived the Holocaust by living underground in a cave for over 500 days. I hosted that world premiere at the Toronto Film Festival in 2012. Several of the survivors were there in person, and that was a night that remains etched in my memory. And her most recent film is uh, called Memory Games that premiered at Doc NYC two years ago. The film looks at a competition of feats of memory. It's a marvelous blend of science and entertainment, and it's now streaming on Netflix. Uh, but the film that we're gonna mainly talk about today um, is Unseen Enemy, which she made between uh, those two other films. It's about pandemic outbreaks. Uh, for the past two weeks, the past two decades, I should explain, alongside her work in film, Janet has also worked on technology and global health. She's held positions, uh, adjunct positions at New York University, Columbia, and Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where she studies how technology can impact global health. She's a co-founder of the Global Health Reporting Center, producing content across platforms. Three years ago, when she directed Unseen Enemy, she was on the front lines of reporting about Ebola in Africa and Zika in Brazil. And Unseen Enemy really warned us of the conditions that could lead to a global outbreak of a virus, that she was predicting the future that is now our present. It aired on CNN in 2017 and is now available for rent on Vimeo. You can find the link at the More on Friday Fix button uh, below. So um, Janet, when I describe you as someone who researches technology and global health, can you give me an example of the things that you've studied that may be having you know, some applications to COVID-19 today? Um, I'm really interested in how um, everyone in the public can access healthcare information. So as simple as, um, do you understand um, if there's a flu outbreak in your city, right? Um, and, um, and if so, where can you get a flu shot? Um, uh, now, obviously, we're in a world where with contact tracing for people who are near people who have COVID-19, um, uh, lots of technology is being used in places like Hong Kong and China to warn people uh, you were near someone who was um, infected and Apple and Google and other people are looking at technology, which, which you would want people to opt in because that raises a lot of questions on privacy and tracking of people. But I think technology can be an incredibly good tool that we should be able to choose if we wanna participate in. So you were reporting on Unseen Enemy largely during the Obama administration, then it was released in 2017 during the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. 
Were you recognizing a shift in global health policy in the U.S. during that time? I think um, I'd back up and say that I think that uh, there's been a need for better pandemic preparedness across the board for a long time. Um, uh, and um, with the Trump administration, there was a sort of re, uh, the National Security Council had a global health security and biodefense unit, which was closed down. Some people stayed and went to other units. But I think in general, people have not understood what we're unfortunately seeing now, and I would like to have not been right about, is that um, when a pandemic happens, it influences and changes every part of your life, your freedom, your the economics, um, your safety. Um, it, it, there is not a part of your life that isn't touched. Um, and, uh, and I think about fires in the 1700s, they used to ravage cities. And then one day we woke up and said, we need fire stations everywhere. We need to be prepared. Um, and we need to do the same um, around epidemics and pandemics because outbreaks will happen, um, but pandemics should be optional as Larry Brilliant says. So the deeper we get into this, I think the harder it might be to recognize what could have happened differently at the outset. And I mean, we already see people performing election year spin saying that, you know, the government, U.S. government did all it could do. I mean, do you think there are things uh, that should have been done differently and that would have had a different outcome? I think we need to build up our public health infrastructure and whether it's about uh, diabetes or opiates or an epidemic, that public health infrastructure protects all of us. Um, and, uh, and that local is connected to national and national is connected to the world because we are all um, six degrees separated from another. Uh, in our world of film, we're all wondering when we'll be able to go back to theaters and have film festivals. What do you think we should be prepared for? Um, I think that um, science is our best friend right now um, and that um, we will need a vaccine um, to have us all sit next to each other at Toronto and Sundance, which I really look forward to. Um, and, and then we also will need treatments. Um, and I think we have um, one drug that is now um, uh, has statistically proven to be effective in severe cases. Um, and uh, and we need, and science is moving fast to get other treatments and a lot of people, I think there are 90 different efforts around vaccines in the world. So I'm really optimistic that we'll get there, but I think we're talking about sometime next year. Well, uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I encourage everyone to check out Unseen Enemy, which uh, like I said, is available for rent um, on Vimeo. Uh, we certainly look forward to uh, what the your Center for Global Health reporting is going to be doing um, throughout this time. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Janet. Thank you, Tom. Okay, I'm going to bring back uh, Julia and Steve um, to uh, help me uh, bring in uh, Gordon Quinn. Um, let me, I had a visual here. Uh, so, uh, Julia, you were telling me about your history with Gordon Quinn and Cartem Quinn. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay, I just saw it. I just saw it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Good use of that time. Um, you were uh, you're tell you were telling me about uh, your that your history with Gordon Quinn dates back all the way to when you were making Union Maids. This yeah. is. A a still from the film. Maybe you want to tell me what uh, what's I, going on there. I love to tell you about this. So Gordon and I are old people now, but we were young together. Uh, you know, and every all these young folks are going to get old one day. So back, um, <laughs> it's weird, but it does happen that you get old. So we were getting ready to shoot. Uh, you know, the interviews. There were three interviews in Union Maids, and they were all shot on one inch open reel video. Uh, and so we needed a location. One of the characters, for whatever reason, we needed a location. So we asked Cartemquin, and they gave us their kitchen, the famous Wright Gordon Cartemquin oh, kitchen. Oh. And um, but we, it was like a pretty cruddy backdrop. You know, the kitchen was old. I mean, was you know pretty basic. It's the same house, right? It's probably the same kitchen. It's the same. Right, the same. Yeah. So we decided we, we were really smart, like we would bring a backdrop. 
And look, look at the backdrop, that black and white patterns. Like what the worst backdrop you could, I don't know, this just shows you how you learn as you get older. Like we thought, oh, and it looked horrible. And then she wore a striped shirt, a dress, I mean. So, but you guys, as you always have, been, were very generous, no questions asked. Sure, you can have our kitchen, we'll keep quiet. We did like a two, three hour interview there. And that's how we met. And I met, you know, Jerry, and I already knew Jenny for the women's movement, you know. Um, and that's when, Gordon, that's when we met. It was, I remember it being 1974. Probably right. I mean, I think <laughs> what's interesting is we were both part of organizations that were part of that movement, you know, that's that right. we, were private. We, we weren't just individuals. Oh, no, 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 no. We were part of a kind of a left-wing political movement called New American Movement. Kartemkin was its own political movement. And um, it really has set the tone. I mean, it has set the tone for years about working on working class stories and being much more inclusive and uh, training people, lending equipment, you know, all these kinds of things that we picked up on. And we tried to do in our own little way here in Dayton, as you know. So we're all friends. So, so uh, Julian, Steve, I'm going to put you back in the yeah. green room. I'm, I'm not going to cut you out in case I, uh, I will, I'll bring you back at the very end. Um, so yeah. stand by. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing whatever your new sartorial uh, flourish is when, uh, when I bring you back. Um, so uh, Gordon, let me uh, do up. Let's see. You're not that. There's Gordon. Um, you know, for people who don't know, let me just say a word about your background. Uh, Gordon is a co-founder of Chicago's Cartem Quinn Films in 1966. He is the Quinn of Cartem Quinn. It's one of the longest running independent documentary companies in the world. They've been home to Steve James's projects like Hoop Dreams and The Interrupters and Life Itself and many other filmmakers, including Bing Liu with his documentary Minding the Gap that was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, this spring was supposed to be a big season for Cartem Quinn. They had three feature docs announced to world premiere at spring festivals, plus Steve James's new series, City So Real, about the Chicago mayoral race. They have another feature doc that pulled back from festivals as it holds out for a later premiere. And all those projects are seeking distribution. Gordon is now 78, and he remains a key figure at Cartem Quinn as artistic director. He's a mentor, providing editorial input to the company's active co-producers, as well as hundreds of cohorts and alumni. He continues to direct and produce. Most recently, he worked on the short 63 boycott that made the Oscar shortlist. His current work in progress is called For the Left Hand, about a piano player. In early March, Gordon was in Melbourne attending the Australian International Documentary Conference. When he returned to Chicago on March 9th, he came down with COVID-19. He spent over a month in the hospital, nearly two weeks of that intubated. He has spent the past two weeks in rehabilitation. He got home on Tuesday and he's joining us today from Chicago. Someone was saying in the chat, is it possible to give a standing ovation in the chat room? Well, you know, here's the time to show your love for Gordon Quinn. Uh, thank you for being here. Let me start with asking how you're feeling. Uh, I'm feeling really good. You know, I have probably several weeks of therapy, you know, occupational uh, and physical therapy ahead of me uh, with therapists to come to the home. Uh, but I'm feeling good. When I left uh, the Shirley Ryan uh, Ability Center, the rehab institute where I was, uh, I asked one of the therapists, or she asked me where I thought I was. I said, I'm 70%. Uh, or I said I'm for 75%, and she said, I think you're 70%, so you're close. So <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've, I've come from sitting on the side of the bed was the most exciting thing I had done for a long time, and I've come from that to really feeling that I'm back in the world. So what are the, some of the things that have been going through your mind the past two months as you, know, as you went deep into this? Well, you know, being that ill is, uh, it's, it's an adventure, you know. Uh, you're in, you're intubated. Uh, they're giving you so much drugs, many of them quite hallucinogenic, that I have vivid memories and fantasies of what was happening to me uh, when I was drugged. 
I'll just share one detail because you were talking about all the festivals uh, being canceled. And I, uh, at one point, I was very concerned. I was in some alternate universe and I, I kept lying down on things. And I was lying down on Jenny's poster for Finding Ying Ying. And I was concerned I'm, I'm interfering with the release of her movie. You know, uh, I wasn't in the real world, you know, and it was only when I was extubated and, you know, came out of that, that I found out about all the festivals being canceled. Mm. Uh, you were talking uh, to me earlier about just how difficult it was to communicate for the you know 12 days, 12, 13 days that you were intubated. Can you, you know, give us a sense of that feeling of helplessness? Yeah, I mean, I I I was conscious for several days after I came out of this state that they put you in with these heavy drugs. I'm intubated. Uh, I've done work, research, and stuff. I never made the film about end of life issues. And I wanted to communicate with them about my DNR status and that I wanted to be DNR. I'd been intubated twice. And I know the more that happens, the more damage do you get. And so, and I was just incredibly frustrated that there's no way to communicate. They give you a letter board, uh, they give you something to write on, but you can't really write. And I'm like, you don't have an iPad, you know, something. And so I, what happened was I got interested and I got an idea to make a, a very focused film, a small film about the difficulties of communicating across the intubation barrier. And I must say, once I had the idea for that film, my attitude changed and I was like, okay, I, I'm going to try to come back because uh, I got to make this film. Uh, and finally, there was a, a, a doctor who did she understood what I was saying about DNR. There was this incredible, and unfortunately it wasn't recorded, uh, but you know, uh, a Zoom call with my wife was on it and the doctors were on it and, and I could see my wife. We hadn't seen each other for you know six weeks when I finally got out of rehab because everything is isolated. And you know, discussing what I was gonna do about my status. And the doctor explained there's an in-between if they extubate me, I could get into trouble that they could fix fairly easily. But if I have a full DNR, they can't do that. So I remember, and I, I actually wrote clearly, okay, you have an hour. <laughs> um, and what, what, you know, we hear all kinds of stories about the way the healthcare system is being uh, pressured uh, right now. What was your experience in that in that regard? Well, you know, we have a, a film out now, Cooked, about the great hook wave, Judith Helfer and, and Fennel Deramus' film uh, about the 75 heat wave in Chicago that killed 760, 80 people in a, in a week, you know. And it's the same story. It's the same zip code narrative of where you know, th th there are parts of this city that are being devastated by this endemic and they're not, you know, the, the black and brown communities are getting second half class health care. I got A plus health care. I was in the best possible places that I could have been. So I think, you know, we keep making these films, making this point, but there really needs to be uh, a much broader movement to kind of tackle this and show the way in which, I mean, I can't believe that we don't have universal health care yet. It's just maddening. Now, Kartemkin has a fantastic executive director in Jolene Pinder, and yeah. you've got a great uh, team in place there. And you personally have had plenty else to worry about the last couple of months, but do you have thoughts about the challenges ahead for, uh, for your company and the filmmakers you work with? Well, we, obviously this is a very challenging time and everything is kind of going on virtual. But I think Jolene has done a tremendous job of building our community. The first thing, my first kind of virtual public appearance was from the rehab center. And we were having a meeting of the Cartemquin alumni virtually. Uh, people have been through our diversity program, people who have been interns, and people who had made films with us. And it was a very large group of people. And I kind of got on and waved, you know, I didn't have a whole lot to say. 
but I think, you know, she's really building that sense of community around the organization and also really being aggressive about finding new, uh, new sources of funding, yeah. you know, and, um, and connecting us to, to some of the funding that's available there through the government, which I think we just never paid any attention to. So it's challenging, but it's exciting to have this new leadership. Uh, you and Julia were talking a minute ago, you know, going back to the uh, to the days when uh, organizations like Cartem Gwynn and New Day Films were emerging. Uh, you know, I wonder if you can you know share some of your memories of what that spirit was like in the 1960s uh, and, and who were the other people that were meaningful to you then? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a time of if you think about it, a lot of meetings, uh, a lot of trying to figure out a new way of being in the world. Uh, you know, should we all be, uh, I, I remember one uh, dramatic moment in where we'd been, you know, meeting for several times and you're rotating leadership. So we had picked up a lot of techniques from uh, the women's movement. And one, this was later, late Cartemquin, you know, before the collective, uh, fell apart at the end of the eight, uh, the seventies. Some of the people who had less power in the group sort of staged a little rebellion, and they said, "Look, we claim we're all equal, and there's no leaders, and blah blah blah, but there are leaders, and because you're unacknowledged, we can't hold you accountable." And I always remember that as being a great lesson and something that you know you, you constantly have to be open to evolving and and learning. You know, and some of the people in the group, Jenny Rohr, Sue Davenport, we, they were really part of the founding of the group because they came to me and Jerry with their film, The Chicago Maternity Center Story, which is still, still shown today and, and still relevant and is still available at New Day, an organization that Julius founded. Mm -hmm. And I had really wanted to be get 63 Boycott, the short I made uh, in into New Day films. and. 63 boycott is that like Julia or Steve, they were talking about going back to traditional, you know, archival and interviews. And that's pretty much what 63 boycott is, except most of the archival is stuff that I shot in the actual demonstration and the, and the uh, boycott of the schools in 1963 that had been sitting, you know, in our, our storage facility all these years. Uh, so if you stay in this business long enough, you can be your own archival resource. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> are, are there other uh, projects from back then that you think about revisiting? Uh, there are, um, you know, but uh, I think at the moment and, and maybe with uh, the, the incredible fractures that are going on, uh, in our society politically, I'm not sure that I, they're at the top of uh, my agenda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so let me bring back uh, Julia and uh, and Steve as we um, uh, wrap this up. Great ties, guy. <laughs> <laughs> Picture Tom, you know, doing yeah, I see. In his, his in his tie. Does he mow the lawn in his bow tie? Does he have a lawn? Well, you know. I do have a lawn. We have a lawn in Montclair, New Jersey. Oh, yeah. Montclair, right, right, of course. Yeah. So, there, now, there's something virtual that, you know, like you couldn't make one for me. <laughs> That's right. Well, I have your white socks on. Pass them down to you. Socks, yes. Do you have your white socks on, Gordon? Yes, I have my white socks on, of course. Okay. Um, so, uh, so if, if anyone didn't see it, uh, Julia and Steve made a video when uh, Gordon was in the hospital. In fact, I'm sorry, I don't have the link right now, but maybe someone will be kind enough to post it in the chat box. It is, it is. Uh, oh, is, there, is it already been posted in there? Uh, okay, well, if you scroll back. I think, you know, it's so delightful having Gordon here because, you know, it, the question you asked, Tom, about, like, uh, I think you're prompting me and Gordon too, probably. We're both in our 70s. I'm about to turn 74 next month. Uh, and you look back, you know, we're at a point in our lives where we have, you know, we have a few years, maybe a year, or so, who knows, but you, you have much more to look back on and sort of, I feel like 
you don't look back at the awards. You don't look back at the award shows or any of that stuff. You look back at first the experiences you had making the films, like very intense experiences. Yeah. But you also look back with great pride. I do, and I think, I don't care if you're 30, 40, 50 today, I believe this will be true for you too. You look back on the ways in which you influenced history or you influence your own community. Yeah, yeah. How you influenced, how you influence the next generation. And you don't start realizing that till you're older, but you're actually doing it all the time. Like, like back in the 60s, 70s, there's a thing, Gordon, where we kind of knew we mattered. On some fundamental level, we knew what we did and we mattered more when we were together. Like we could matter. And I think that is completely still true today. I don't think people feel it the same way though. Young, younger people sort of feel at sea in the middle of all this stuff going on in general. I mean, not just with COVID. And maybe don't feel like they matter. Maybe just their films matter or their awards matter. But what we choose to do with our lives and how we choose to pass on our values and see, test them, see if they still work. You and I have done that for 50 years or more, right? Yeah. So that's, it's how you guide. I think how, I'm very proud about how I've tried to guide and I think you should be Gordon, how, and Tom too, he's much younger, but he's guiding the next generation by even doing this, which is right to keep us together, to keep us as a community together and thinking about what we're doing and why we matter. Yeah, no, I think that, what you said, Julia, is one of the things that we're, it's very important to pass on to the next generation in these difficult times, that they do matter and their work matters, and that that's more important than anything else. Then, yeah, so. Julia, can I ask you a little bit about the, you know, the feeling you described of, of knowing that what you were doing uh, mattered, you know, 40, 50 years ago? Because what's interesting to me is I think, you know, today, you have this platform of Netflix and, and you have these the ability for millions of people around the world to see your films. 40 years ago, you were carrying around 16 millimeter uh, canisters, uh, you know, trying to you know, show them, you know, community halls. Um, can you kind of reflect on, on that juxtaposition? You know, that's a great question. Cause you know, I felt it's harder on Netflix you know, Netflix has been good to us. I'm glad we're on Netflix. But you don't feel the connection with the audience. You just don't. When you're carrying 16 millimeter reels or you're showing your film at the church basement or the school or whatever, and Gordon knows this, you can see people are being impacted and you can build on that impact. You can connect them to local folks who will be there when you're gone. Uh, and I don't know if that's so it's it's much more of a I don't know how you describe it like okay our film is seen around the world but well, well it's what? abstract it's, it's, it's more visceral to, to be in the room and it, obviously we all are missing movie theaters right now and I feel like that 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 personal connection but I, that ability but, to rally people is yeah, you know, yeah. to be in person to make it you know you know I mean, go, go, I think Gordon had something to that you uh you know, it's it's a core value, I think, of yours and ours. And and having made labor films, you know this. Uh, I've had the experience of showing a reel-to-reel -reel tape, shot on tape film, uh, talking heads, absolutely one of the worst things we ever made. <laughs> and I'm showing it to steel workers who are gonna make a decision based on what they see in our film. We were showing it in bars and living rooms. Right. It was an era where we had to explain to them, no, 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 this is just in your living room. It's not in, uh, you're not being broadcast all over. You know, they thought they were on TV. They're gonna make a life-changing decision, maybe whether to go on strike or not, based on your film. That's an incredibly valuable and important audience. The mass audience is also important, mm -hmm. but we have to understand that difference. And so I made boycott because I want to get it into classrooms. That's where it's going to have its impact. Mm -hmm. It's in school today about kids who walked out of school and shut the school system down over racism. And so 
I think we've always had that interest in the big platform and the broadcast on PBS or Netflix, but also the people showing a film to people who are going to make a decision based on what they saw in your film. And we've seen it happen. We've seen a film change a meeting that was going one way and our film is shown and the vote comes out a different way. Yeah. We so we've had that with union mates where people are on a picket line and getting discouraged and they bring them together and show the film and they they realize their power and they got to stick it out. You know, I mean, there's lots of, there's so many examples like growing up female started so many women's centers because it connected with people on the ground who were ready, but they brought people together. Films bring, I mean, in the old days, films bring people together. And I think there's that's still true though. We just, the younger ones have to, like people like Tom have to figure out and other people listening, how to make that happen now. The, as you say, core value is how do our films matter? How do our lives matter? And that means a different thing in different eras, right? Now I want to I want to yeah. counter and say though there's value in the the the, the width of a huge uh, platform like Netflix. Mm -hmm. You know our film was pirated all over China. China. Yeah, and it's because it showed with Chinese subtitles in Taiwan and Hong Kong. American Factory did, and the response that on Weibo, the the Chinese version of Twitter, the response was incredible, mm -hmm. and that's something we could never have done. Uh, on a smaller scale, you know, people were raising questions about the the cost of this sort of miracle that happened in China, the economic growth, mm -hmm. the the human rights cost, the environmental cost, and it's it's like that's the exact kind of dialogue you hope a film can spark. It's much wider. It's not like we're in person. It's not like we we get to have a conversation next to the projector afterwards. But the fact that it was so on a huge, so much on a huge scale, is very very meaningful. It's different, yeah. Both are important. Both are important. Okay, it's not, Gordon. and it doesn't have to be a, comp a competition. Both are important, okay, Gordon. But let's not forget about the direct impact on the people who, oh. right, in, in the, yeah. So uh, as uh, I wrap this up, I, I wanna kind of build on what you were just saying, Steve, about um, American Factory. Can you talk about some of the experiences that you, of the people who are in American Factory, you co it covers native Ohio workers and visiting Chinese uh, uh, workers, their managers back in China. You know, as this film made its way out into the world, you know, both Julie and Steve, you know, can, can you give a little bit more detail about what that experience was like? Well, how it changed. Well, we were very lucky. We worked with Participant Media, and they built a major impact campaign that rolled the film out across the, this country for months. Uh -huh. We did a what we call a factory town tour, where we showed the film in, in Pittsburgh, Detroit, Louisville, Kentucky, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and did events bringing together labor and management to talk about working conditions and the future of work. Mm -hmm. uh, then we got invited to conferences, uh, the Atlantic Magazine and uh, SOCAP, Social Entrepreneurs, where we showed clips from the film, also talking about the future of work. But then we would look around and say, well, where are the workers at, yeah, the, at this conference? Right. And but that was an opportunity for us to say, if you're going to talk about the future of work, wh why don't you have workers here? Why don't you have you workers representation. Rep representatives yeah. here? We did these kind of events basically from summer of 2019 till December, and it was it was just great. And 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 then the 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 sort of the brush fire that happened in China uh, within days of the film launching on Netflix was also incredibly great. You know, there's a whole labor movement in China that that we don't get to hear about outside of the the party union. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like a, a, sort of an independent labor movement. People are organizing uh, and striking against factories that, that make our iPhones and and everything. And to be part of what they're going through to help have this film be sort of in the mix of what they're talking about we is, hope it is. Yeah, is, I think is, is very, very meaningful. Another thing, you know, I got to say is sometimes, you know, doing these events and calling out the people who invited you and paid your airfare to go and saying like, hey, guys, where's the workers here? You know, I mean, out loud in the platform. Sometimes you have to really be willing to say the hard thing and not feel like you're alienating somebody or maybe Netflix will never hire you again or, you know, maybe you'll never get invited back. You know, it's like 
we got to be bold and really say what needs to be said, right, Gordon? I mean, you it's as, like as that. You were, absolutely. <laughs> as you were at the Oscars. Well, it worked out. No, but I mean, this was way before the Oscars. This is way uh, no, I, under I understand. I understand. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, we, favorite, we've all been, I mean, we've been doing that for years, you know. Right. You guys I, you have to say. I sure. try to say filmmakers because they get very nervous about biting the hand that feeds them. Right, so right. The reality is they yeah. can't do it. And even if you bite their hand, you're not going to be, you know, there is no blacklist today in a sense. Well, the funny, my favorite thing after Julia said, workers of the world unite uh, at the Oscars. The Fox News or someone uh, had a had a little clip or comment of like, did you know Julia Reichert made a film about communists? <laughs> and, and it was like so funny that uh, well, they this is a surprise. The Obama filmmakers quote the Communist Manifesto yeah. at the so, Oscars. Yeah. Anyway. And by the way, Netflix, Higher Ground Participant, they totally have our backs. They are, they're they great. Are, they yeah. have been both so great and supportive of us every step of the way. You're too nervous. They're not nervous at all. They're not nervous. I'm saying even in our community, there are people that like, I think we have to remind people that we've all fought these battles and had these confrontations over the years. I've had huge battles of Julia's been involved with them too. With yeah. public television, and we still work with public television and we support it. We fight for it, but yeah. we also battle them when, when they're on the wrong side. We, we have to keep our community alive so that when one of us goes on gets in trouble or goes online or on the line that will back them up yeah. because people will not we have a strong community right and you can we can be honest we don't have to worry about where's our next grant going to come from or our next deal i don't think that's what i think happy may day well thank you all uh for being with us uh from the strong midwest representation here from ohio uh julian steve from uh chicago gordon i'm gonna let you go but we're uh, both looking forward to all the, the work you guys are doing thank you thanks and thanks, Rafaela tom. and tom thank you for doing this tom this, is great. this is so important and great people. community service yeah thank you well, okay i'm gonna say goodbye to you and say goodbye to you gordon and uh, just uh, if you want to hear more from Julie and Steve, I did an interview with them about American Factory on my podcast, uh, Pure Nonfiction. Uh, you can listen to that at purenonfiction.net or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, for documentary filmmakers, I wanted to plug this article in the Los Angeles Times about uh, interviewing documentary filmmakers about how they're moving ahead in their current um, productions. Uh, we have a link to it at the More on Friday Fix button uh, below. Um, this is important. Many of you know that Doc NYC Pro Panels are normally take place in November. Now we're expanding that content online throughout the year, and you can access it anywhere in the world. The first class is going to happen next week. It's an immersive two-day webinar focused on creating highly clickable content. This is a skill we could all use for what we're doing online. My colleague, Caitlin Boyle, the festival's director of industry and education has assembled a team of experts. We'll hear from the teams at the digital marketing company, Smart House Creative at Vice News and from the cult doc hit, Fantastic Fungi. The immersive is gonna take place over two sessions uh, next week. If you enroll, you can watch live or at any time at your convenience. The cost of the two classes is just $10, uh, but you can get it for even less. We're offering a special discount right now for the next two hours. Um, you get 20% off with the code Friday Fix uh, in, in lowercase, like case sensitive. Um, you can click the button more on Friday Fix uh, to get more information about that immersive. And then our free Monday memo is a great way to start your week with uh, all of the documentary news of the week. Um, you can sign up at docnyc.net for the uh, Monday memo. I want to give a big thanks to our sponsor, IFC Films Unlimited. It's through their support that we can offer Friday Fix for free. The subscription site is home to great documentaries, dramas, and comedies. It's available in the U.S. and Canada on Apple TV, or you can subscribe on Amazon Prime. Thank you, IFC Films Unlimited, for their support. Next week. I'll be back with episode three. 
We'll focus on PBS's upcoming five-part series, Asian Americans, interviewing two of its executive producers, Renee Tajima Pena and uh, Jean Shen. I'll also talk to filmmaker Hao Wu, who's directed several documentaries in China, including the Netflix short, All in My Family. Hao was in China around the outbreak of COVID-19. Then he watched it overtake the US. He'll share insights from those experiences. And we all know that there's been rising expressions of racism against Asians in the United States. So we're gonna have a lot to discuss. You can RSVP for episode three. Uh, again, go to the more on Friday fix button and tell all your friends. This show has been recorded and will remain free at this link. I wanna thank the Doc NYC team, DeWitt Davis, Sarah Moto, Caitlin Boyle, and Rafaela Nehausen. Finally, thanks to our guests, Janet Tobias, Stephen Bognar, Julia Reichert, and Gordon Quinn. Let's all take strength from their work and determination. I hope you'll be back next Friday.